spill between Britain and the EU on the transition deal, that's the period of two years after Brexit, looks to have been reached. David Davis is in Brussels, where he's been meeting with the EU's negotiator, Michel Barnier, and we'll hear a little bit from that press conference in a moment. It's potentially a big moment, though, in the Brexit process. It means there's an agreed set of rules to smooth the way from our current relationship to our new relationship with the EU. The EU wants this period, which the British government calls the implementation period, to last until the end of December 2020. So we're all looking forward to finding out where each side has given way. It is a negotiation after all. Here's Michel Barnier. And uh, what we're presenting to, to you today here with David is a legal text, a joint legal text, which constitutes, in my mind, a decisive step, because we were able this morning to agree, and after all those days and nights of hard work, on a large part of what will make up an international agreement for the ordered withdrawal of the United Kingdom. Now, we're also joined in the studio by Bernard Jenkin, the Conservative MP. Welcome to you. First of all, though, I want to ask my two guests here. Neil O'Brien, what do you say to the announcement by Michel Barnier that there has been a legal text agreed on the withdrawal agreement and it sounds as if some sort of agreement's been made on transition? I think this is really great news because it's another milestone on the way to delivering Brexit, to delivering it in a smooth and orderly way. And that is a big prize because it means we'll get back control of our laws, control of our borders and control of our money. So this is a big step forward. It's what I think most of this country now want. People voted for Brexit. We need to get on with it. We need to do it in a sensible and orderly way. And this is another milestone on the way to doing that. But Bernard Jenkin, as we understand it, as we understand it, sorry, I don't want to be uh, derogatory at the start of the interview. As we understand it, um, the agreement has been done that everything pretty well stays the same during that transition period, during that two year period to December 2020. But we won't have a rule. We won't have rather a seat at the table. In other words, we will be a rule taker and not a rule giver. Are you happy with that? Well, it's all going to be in the small print, which we haven't had a chance to look at yet. And in fact, Michel Barnier has presented the pages of text on a massive slide behind him, uh, saying that all the bits coloured in yellow are the bits where the drafting is still subject to alteration. So we don't have a finished text. And there are some bits in, I'm, I'm told, are in green, which would seem to be, on my television, indecipherable from the bits in yellow. But would you be happy to accept the to fact that we wouldn't have a seat? But w would you accept the fact that Britain wouldn't have a seat at the table when decisions are being made during that transition period? Well, there, there's going to have to be some pretty significant safeguards that no country would submit itself completely to a foreign jurisdiction, which is what the EU becomes after we've left, and just accept new laws and new court rulings. There's going to have to be some mediation arrangement, even if only by our own parliament, because uh, when you're no longer represented on the court, when you're no longer sitting at the table to make the new laws, how can we possibly just make ourselves a prisoner of this arrangement? And uh, that wouldn't be acceptable. Uh and there are other issues, like we need to be... We're going to be apparently bound by the, the doctrine of sincere cooperation, but we want it explicitly understood that during that period we can go and negotiate our own trade deals. We can't implement them, but we can negotiate and sign them. All right. Well, do you, see this like as, do you see this as success, a moment at which the government can claim that it has got agreement on this implementation period? Well, I hope so, because we were calling for a transitional agreement with access to the single market and the customs union a year ago, and the government made some demands which couldn't be met, and now they've had to accept that that wasn't negotiable. And we really do need this smooth transition because the amount of uncertainty and chaos which has been caused for industry and business has really been terrible. And, and we don't want to see a repeat of this pattern where the government requests things that it can't achieve. We need a better approach. Right, I'm going to talk to um, Gavin Riley, um, political correspondent for TV3 Ireland, in just a moment. But before I go to him, Helen Goodman, would you be happy to support um, a deal when it comes before Parliament later this year if the issue of Ireland and Northern Ireland hasn't been completely resolved or there's any indication that there might be some infrastructure at the border? Well, that's a lot of ifs. But we think that getting the Northern Ireland 
border sorted uh, on the basis of a soft border is absolutely essential to a satisfactory deal. Right. Well, we've just heard here from Michelle Barnier on the Irish border issue that both sides, the UK and the EU, are committed to all parts of what was agreed in December. And just briefly to summarise, what was agreed in December um, in that draft text was either there was going to be a full free trade agreement that would take in the issue of the border um, or that technology would would provide the solution, which is what the government has been suggesting, but has been rejected so far uh, by certain parties on the EU side, or the backstop issue, the third one, which is that Northern Ireland would remain aligned to the EU, which um, is the least favourite option for most sides, um, certainly in the UK. Um, Gavin Riley, do you think it's a problem that the issue of the border hasn't yet been resolved, even though this implementation period does seem to have been agreed? It certainly seems to be a point of anxiety, Joe, that the, the Irish government is still waiting to find what they see as very workable uh, solutions from the British government about how exactly such technological solutions might work. I mean, the Irish government has been very transparent and upfront, and it says that its best possible solution, the case that it wants to see, is a very all-encompassing free trade agreement between the European Union and the United Kingdom, which would render the border question obsolete because they would still be part of the same trading bloc as they always have been. Uh, but if, this, if that isn't going to be a runner, at least for the, the very near future and if there doesn't seem to be any prospect of the UK coming forward with technological solutions that at least Ireland considers feasible and it certainly seems that they perceive those solutions as not existing anywhere else in the world now, the real question for the Irish government is uh, whether the UK government is in fact prepared to honour the backstop agreement that you mentioned just a few moments ago, where essentially Northern Ireland would remain uh, part of the European single trading area, uh, even if that does mean that it becomes fragmented from the rest of, of the UK. Now, the Irish government, of course, says that it doesn't want to do that. And the Taoiseach Leo Varadkar has really been at pains to try and articulate this point because it is perceived sometimes that perhaps this is a, some sort of an agenda to try and create a united Ireland by stealth, to try and fragment the UK and have Northern Ireland broken away uh, from the rest of mainland Britain. Uh, that, that The Irish government says it's not its intention at all. But what it does want to see is some sort of commitment from the UK that, in fact, it's prepared to put its money where its mouth is. And that if there is no better agreement, if there is no other solution on the table, uh, that that is something that the UK is prepared to honour. It is interesting to see that in that agreement that Michel Barnier has posted just a few moments ago, uh, that text is highlighted yellow, which right. means that although the final legal technicalities aren't agreed yet, they are at least both agreed in principle. Because bearing in mind, Joe, that two weeks ago, Theresa May appeared to suggest to the House of Commons that that sort of agreement was something that no British Prime Minister could stand over. It she now did. seems that her no, government might in fact well, be prepared to agree to do so. But Bernard Jenkins, first of all, though, we've just heard from Michelle Barnier. On the UK-Ireland border, we have agreed the backstop pollution, uh, solution must form part of the legal text of the withdrawal agreement. It will apply unless and until another solution is found. Is that acceptable? to you that the UK government has signed up to the idea that unless another solution is found, Northern Ireland will remain aligned to EU rules. Um, I would want to look at the small print because... Well, this is what Barnier said. Say. So I've just had from They've Michelle just Barnier... published a very long document and you are quoting a tiny part of it from me and trying to screw me to the floor on it. Until I've read the I'm document. not trying to do anything of the sort. I'm asking for your reaction I, to what is pretty clear. They've agreed the backstop solution must form part of the legal the text. The fact is there Are is going to be that? no infrastructure at the border of Northern Ireland unless the EU puts it there. Now, if the EU is stupid enough and wants to breach the Northern Ireland terms of the Northern Ireland um, peace agreement, the Belfast agreement, uh, wants to put up obstacles and be obstructive, well, then they're going to go ahead and do that. But actually, in the end, I think they're going to cooperate. Well, what do you say to that, Helen Goodman, that actually the EU... There is a political will that is lacking on the side of the on EU. Side. I think that it's no good saying, just because someone else is in the driving seat, it doesn't matter if we drive over the cliff edge. I think what we really need is a clear way to ensure that there is a soft border. And so far, the government hasn't produced it. But is there a lack of will on the side of the EU in this? If they wanted to find a solution, then one would be found. I think yes, it's quite a correct. tricky technical thing to do because of the red lines which Theresa May has put forward, which I think make it very difficult. But, I mean, why, why should the EU break its rules for the UK in terms of the Irish border, allow the UK to come out of the customs union and the single market, and yet keep a completely open and frictionless border. Um, because, as they say, they've never, ever agreed to us cherry-picking when it comes to the rules and the integrity of the single market and the customs union. 
I think that the reason why we'll end up agreeing something on this is because both sides want it. Both sides don't want to see a hard border between North and South of well, Ireland. I, I, and on the other hand, we, don't, we can't see a hard border between one bit of the UK and the other bit of the UK. Now, this is, it's not going to be an easy issue to solve. No one's going to pretend that. And it's probably going to be one of the last issues to get solved. But with goodwill on all sides, it's clearly soluble. Right, right. It's been solved in other parts of the country. And I do feel a little bit sympathetic to Bernard. <laughs> I mean, I, to, me, to me, the text that you just read out, which he's had no time to respond to, seems totally reasonable. He's had time and, to respond and, to it. He and, hasn't and, seen and, the full context, but he has and, had time just, to respond to it. Just to make one, one last point on, on, on this. Um, it, it's just saying something that's obvious. It was always going to be the case that there needs to be a deal that um, deals with the problem of the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic. That was just always going to be the case. Right. Obviously, it needs to be solved as part of the deal. Are you happy with the fact that the agreement today during transition is going to give EU citizens who come during that two-year period exactly the same rights as their predecessors who come and who were here before March 2019? Well, if if what you say is correct, no, I would not be happy because we're going to leave the European Union in March 2019 and I suspect you will find in the small print that that's not what the agreement actually says. What crucial differences would you like to see? Well, for a start, we need to be able to register, verify and register the people coming into the country. Well, we could do that now. Of, uh, to check that they're, they're EU citizens and to register them. We, we, we could we do that now in no, the single market. No, no, we don't actually. We don't, we don't do it, but no, we could do it. The no, government could do it, do it if it and wanted And in fact, to. Uh, under EU law, that could be described as discrimination if we're registering some EU citizens and not others who are coming into the country. So let's be accurate about this. Um, and also the enforcement mechanisms. We can't have the, you know, the United Kingdom Parliament bound lock, stock and barrel by the European Court of Justice as it is now when we're no longer represented on the European Court of Justice and we're no longer part of that jurisdiction. Yeah. Why are we passing an Act of Parliament that, ab that abolishes the European Communities Act that brings all of this into law? It's going to be technically very difficult to exactly replicate this. I think there are going to be technical legal details that will end up with us having um, a subtly different jurisdiction where we perhaps have regard to what is happening mm. in the European Union and we oblige our courts to um, do this, to have regard, but we cannot actually be, be right, bound what you, as we are now because let, we're leaving. It doesn't respect the re referendum result. Right, but let's imagine that on the EU citizens that is the case and that is what we understand from uh, the agreement today. What, well, are you we'll going to do, well, what are you going to do about it? Even if well, I think, I think it'll be very difficult to get that agreement through the House of Commons because how can you, uh, you know, most constituencies in the, in, the, in the House of Commons voted leave. They voted f to be free of the European Court of Justice and of the lawmaking capacity of the European Union. That is what the referendum was fundamentally about. And you're nodding and, your head, and, you'd be in agreement with and, that. And, and, and to finish up in the, in the same case, but without sitting at the table, without actually being a member, I mean, this becomes a constitutional outrage. And uh, I'm, I'm quite certain the government's not going to agree to it. And would it which be the same on fishing? Which is why we need to look at the yeah, small No, I print. take that. But would you feel the same about fishing quotas if we have no say on that and we're still part of the EU Well, I think fish is a very big problem because how can we allow the EU to set fishing quotas for British boats, particularly as big changes in the regulatory regime are coming well, through, on, on, when we have no, no chance yeah. of taking part in the negotiations. Right, so what are you that, going to do, though? That. What is the government going to do if there are people like Jacob Rees-Mogg and Bernard Jenkin who can't sign up to this transition well, deal two, if that is the way it has been expressed? Two, two things about that. Firstly, on, on fish, it looks from the rumours that are going around on Twitter like actually we're getting a very good deal exactly. today on fish. So I'm, I'm feeling positive about that. that and I looked, at what, I looked at what Jacob Rees-Mogg uh, said and it seemed like something everyone would agree to. Basically, obviously, we won't be able to actually implement new trade deals until we've left the EU. That's just a, a matter of logic. But uh, if we can negotiate them and, and get to the point of signing them during the transition phase, I think everyone's going to be totally happy with that. Correct. Just before I let Bernard Jenkin um, go, David Davis has said that the UK will be able to step up, put and sign new trade deals across the globe that will come into force once the implementation period is over. I think we can actually hear him say it. Let's find out. The United Kingdom will be able to step out, sign and ratify new deals, new trade deals with old friends and new allies around the globe for the first time in more than 40 years. These will come into force when the implementation period is over, providing new opportunities for businesses across the United Kingdom and seizing one of Brexit's greatest opportunities. Bernard Jenkins, your reaction to that? I'm delighted about that. There's one important caveat that mm -hmm. has to be put, is that we must be able to conduct those negotiations in private. We shouldn't 
be obliged to have the EU sitting at the table. We can't but they be... have said, haven't they, up until now, that they would like to be part well, of what's going on? Frankly, we, we can't be conducting a negotiation with the EU alongside every negotiation that we're conducting in but the World, let's, world let's Trade Let's also recognise that that's a major diplomatic mm -hmm. triumph. There are a lot of yeah. people in Brussels who did not want to agree that. David Davis has just read out historic. But if they're overseeing we... it, but if they're overseeing it in the way Bernard Jenkins has just it's, set out, then no, actually we don't no, have our no own control. We haven't taken be... back control over these, this very well, important part of our foreign policy. But we will have taken back control because we'll be able to set our own trade deals. That's, that is taking back control by, by definition. That is something that a lot of people in Brussels didn't want to agree to. The Prime Minister insisted on it and now we've achieved it. That's really a, a big result. All right, and Agreed. it's time for you to go. Bernard Jenkins, well, thank you very are. much for coming in. Dispensed with um, you. <laughs> <laughs> Kindly, I hope. Um, Gavin Riley, I haven't quite dispensed with you, though, um, before, before you're allowed to uh, go away. In terms of the Irish government, following on from what you said at the beginning, is there now a more positive, do you think, outlook from the Irish government in terms of engaging with the UK over finding a solution that could involve technology? There probably certainly is going to be an awful lot more good faith about it all, Joe. I think the fact that now that David Davis has been willing to, to stake his claim and clearly that the UK appears in principle now to be willing to implement the, the so-called backstop that was agreed three months ago uh, certainly will help. I think there probably will be some frustration, though, among the Irish side as to how long it's taken. Because if you take it from a very narrow uh, reading from the Irish side of things, uh, what we got out of the UK last December was an agreement that if no other solution could be found, that Northern Ireland would honour enough European rules in order to avoid a border in the first place. It seems that after Theresa May perhaps being seen to possibly backtrack from that in Westminster in the last few weeks, that David Davis has now been prepared to commit to that again. But all we've got is a reassertion in principle of a principle to which the UK signed up three months ago anyway. So there probably will be some uh, anxiety about how long it's taken, given that now Brexit is only uh, a year and a week away, albeit with some transition on the way. Uh, there might well be some more uh, earnest uh, intention on, on the Irish government's part to talk about these technological solutions, um, in part now because time is really of the essence, that if we're going to have to start looking at some kind of infrastructure, even if it is only technological cameras, uh, you know, some sort of surveillance and the likes, it is something that Ireland will no doubt be willing to pursue. It was something which, at the start of these negotiations, they had ruled out entirely right. in theory. It now seems they're open to it. I suppose the question is, when will the UK come up with the solutions? Governor O'Reilly, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Um, I can also say that the transition period, the implementation period that the government calls it, will end in December 2020, which is what David Davis had asked for. And um, For more reporting and analysis of Brexit, check out the BBC News website. That's bbc.co.uk forward slash Brexit. In the studio here for reaction, Lynn Davidson from The Sun and Sam Coates from The Times. Welcome to both of you. Lynn Davidson, and something to cheer about? <laughs> um, I think it depends what side you're on, really. I think if you're a Scottish Conservative um, MP at the moment, you may not be necessarily very happy with what's been said about fishing. Certainly John Lamont um, tweeted last night that he would not, he'd be willing to vote down a final Brexit deal uh, if there were not guarantees over fishing quotas and vessels. And uh, what we're not entirely clear about is timing on that but certainly not, ha not, not happiness coming from their quarters. How much has the government had to compromise, uh, Sam Coates, on getting this transition agreement and this legal text of the withdrawal agreement that was broadly signed up to in December? Um, the broad answer is quite a lot. I mean, you call it a transition, Theresa May calls it an implantation. Frankly, it's a standstill. Our relationship with the European Union uh, is basically going to stay the same with us not having a seat in the decision-making bodies. Uh, and so we're not going to leave in the way that most people would understand in March 2019, next year, but that's now going to be delayed until December 2020. And just to get that, uh, as it were, 21-month extension, we've had to abandon plans to stop EU citizens who come here during the transition period from staying. We've had to abandon the kind of desire to bring back control of fishing. Uh, we've, um, we even wanted the transition to go on longer. Uh, Brussels said no. So on those things, uh, we've had to essentially climb down to in ensure that our relationship stays the same. And briefly, before we go to Brussels, to our correspondent there, I mean, Lynn Davidson, how much trouble are the likes of Bernard Jenkin, whom we've just had on here, saying he wouldn't be happy to sign up to a deal that gave the same, exactly the same rights to EU citizens who arrive uh, during that transition period? Um, and colleagues like Jacob Rees-Mogg are going to cause the Prime Minister. Well, well, I think they're just deciding right now. I was just speaking to speaking to a couple of MPs on text, just as as, as it's all rolling out. Of course, someone like Bernard Jenkins obviously been very loyal to Theresa May as well, has been very quite outspoken about backing her. But this puts them in a very awkward position now, especially like we were saying about fishing. If quotas are being decided, we're not even in the room. 
Right, so it'll be the vassal yeah. state that Jacob Rees-Mogg exactly. talked about. Um, just before we continue, Adam Fleming is there. Adam, we saw lots of colour coding going on behind Michelle, but oh, there it is. There it is. Is it as clear as mud? Um, well, yeah, it's actually quite difficult to read just because try reading that with the mm. big green yeah. highlighting. Well, on I'm it. glad you're doing it and not me. Um, I think my first impressions are both sides are obviously over the moon, a bit giddy because they've been negotiating all through the weekend, all through the night to get as much of this document as green as possible, uh, which is obviously a big achievement because two weeks ago this was the EU's text. The UK hadn't seen it, hadn't really contributed to it and hadn't given their say. And now they've managed to wrap up lots of it, about 75% of it, in quite a short period of time. And they've managed to close some key chapters. So the, most of the citizens' rights stuff is agreed. Most of the financial settlement stuff is agreed. Most of the transition period is agreed. So that's that. they're pretty happy about that. Mm. But there's still some quite big caveats. It looks like the 25% that hasn't been agreed is governance. How do you enforce disputes and make sure the agreement is adhered to by both sides right. after Brexit Day. And what does the European Court of Justice have to do with that? And the other big bit that's not agreed, Northern Ireland and Ireland. Mm. Now, I don't know about you, but those two things sound like quite big things to still agree. Right. So they've been kicked down the road, or certainly the issue of Ireland. I'm surprised there's been no decision over the European Court of Justice and how and whether it would still arbitrate um, over any disputes that arise or any new laws that are brought in during that two year implementation period by the EU. So uh, what they've done here is they have agreed a governance mechanism for the citizens' rights part of this. That was agreed back in December. That's that whole thing of you will to the UK will courts will make voluntary references yeah. to the ECJ for about eight years. So that bit of the governance bit was dealt with. Now we, it seems that for the transition period, the British idea of a joint committee to handle disputes that arise during the implementation period or the transition period, that that's been agreed to, although we'll have to go through the document and see the details. It's what comes after that that uh, is, is still to be agreed. And is there a role for the European Court of Justice? I mean, that seems like quite a quite a big sticking point still. And what about signing up to free trade deals? Um, David Davis has just said that the UK is going to be allowed to do that. But Bernard Jenkin, the Conservative MP just in the studio with me before, said, yes, that's great, but not if we have to defer to the EU during that two-year uh, implementation period while we are setting up these free trade deals. Do you know what the decision is there? Uh, uh, I'm trying to find that in this document here. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 hang on. Here we go. Oh, Article 124, paragraph impressed. 4. Um, yeah, it still has the language saying they've got to be authorised by the European Union. Right. So the UK will have the power to negotiate and sign and ratify free trade deals, but they cannot be implemented unless they've got permission from the EU. So that has pretty much stayed the same. I mean, that's always been a bit of a bizarre one, actually, because all along Michel Barnier has said it's OK for the UK to go out into the world and talk to third countries and talk about trade deals. It's just getting it written down that the Brits wanted. OK, when the giddiness has died down um, in Brussels, what happens next? So uh, Michel Barnier is going to take this document to the meeting of EU affairs ministers for the 27 to get it signed off by at ministerial level tomorrow. Then he'll go to the Wednesday meeting of the European Commission with Jean-Claude Juncker, where the commissioners will sign it off. And then he'll take it to the European Council, the meeting of leaders on Friday, where they will sign it off. And they will also sign off their guidelines for phase two, which is that six page document setting out their blueprint for how the talks about the future relationship are going to work. That will be another big, big symbolic moment. Although we know roughly what those guidelines are going to say, so it's not going to be any big surprise. And then it will be a case of how quickly can they get down to talking about that future relationship? Will it be straight after the meeting of the European Council and the meeting of the leaders? Or will there be another bureaucratic process where Michel Barnier takes those guidelines away and clarifies them into an even more detailed document, which is what happened with all the stuff about the transition period? Or can he get down to it straight away? Right. Worth remembering, though, what the EU says is the best case scenario for the outcome from those, agree those negotiations. It is a political agreement about the shape of the future relationship. Mm. The EU saying it will not be the fully fledged free trade deal that the British government talks about. So that's what the next few months is going to be about, is just how detailed is that political declaration and just how much does it look like a free trade agreement? Adam, thank you very much.